And welcome to Lift FM 98.5, 103.3 FM, 97.9 FM, and of course, worldwide at liftfm.com. And of course, all of our programs here on Second Chances are always available. We keep a complete archive at advantageradioministries.org, and we have a wonderful program, new program every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, right here at Lift FM. And of course, um, we just have had so many wonderful guests, and we have a, a wonderful guest with us tonight, Mr. Paul Cardin. And uh, Paul, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Well, it's a privilege to be sure. And Paul, uh, understand that you are the general editor of Christianity, Cults, and Religions. And, and for those that are not familiar with that, to tell us what that is. Well, it's a very unusual book. Uh, it is a compilation of recent materials intended to help the average Christian, especially, to get the essential information they need about the most prominent and active religious movements that they're likely to encounter in their everyday lives. Not only religious groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, or Buddhism broadly, but even occultic movements uh, like the Rosicrucians or even dealing with Freemasonry and so forth. It covers a lot of groups in their essentials, three groups it covers in depth, and it's very heavily illustrated. It's just really a, uh, a remarkable piece of work, and I'm glad to have had a hand in it. Now, Paul, uh, a lot of times we'll get into a person's work uh, before we, or, you know, after we've actually gotten into their testimony, but I'm going to get into your testimony with you, but um, as we do that, is there anything in your background that kind of led you into to learning about this and then sharing the information in the books? Well, uh, I was influenced early uh, in my high school years, really, by the late Walter Martin, founder of the Christian Research Institute, author of The Kingdom of the Cults. I encountered one of his books uh, on a friend's shelf on a rainy day and was simply captivated. It opened up to me a world that I barely knew existed. And then a few years later, I encountered a group called Ex-Mormons for Jesus and began volunteering with them. And <clears throat> within four years, I was, uh, I was on the mission field in Africa, helping to warn Christians uh, in other parts of the world about groups like Mormonism. Uh, for those that are not really familiar with uh, the Mormon religion, can you give us a little bit of, a, a, of what it is that they're dealing with? They run into someone who is uh, into that? Yeah, it's very important because uh, whether you like him or you don't, uh, Mitt Romney is an active Mormon, and uh, some folks feel he has a shot at becoming president. And for some Christians, what he believes would be very important. He's a very mainstream Mormon, which means uh, he's been through the temple uh, and has received washings and anointings and sworn oaths uh, in order to advance to the point where he can become a god himself. Mormonism teaches that over our world, our planet, is a god who's a human being, who used to be uh, just a fallen regular mortal on another planet like you or me, but he was such a good Mormon, uh, was so obedient to the laws of uh, the Mormon gospel, as they understand them, that he advanced spiritually to the point of becoming a god, a flesh-and-bone god, with at least one wife, probably many more, who makes spirit children sexually, and sends other spirits in, into bodies here on earth. And <clears throat> it's, a, it's a system of salvation by works uh, that is really centered not so much on Jesus Christ or their version of him, but on Joseph Smith, uh, their founding prophet, who uh, died in 1844, and whose interpretation of reality guides almost everything the Mormons believe. If he says to believe what the Bible tells you in a certain place, you believe that. If he says not what the Bible, what the Bible tells you in a given place, you don't believe that. It all, it's really, it's all about Joseph. But that's just a snapshot of what Mormonism is about. Mm. Now, um, Paul, early on uh, in your young years, were you a Christian at a, a young age, or was it something that happened as you uh, got into your teens or your early adulthood, or, or when did you become a Christian, I guess? Well, I became a Christian uh, as a sophomore in high school. <coughs> I, was, uh, I, I was raised in a spiritually divided home. My mother was a nominal Presbyterian. 
I walked across the street to a Disciples of Christ Church all by myself most Sundays. Mm. My father was a nominal Christian scientist. He was, a, he was born into the cult of Mary Baker Eddy that denies the reality of sin, sickness, and death. And so God got a hold of me when uh, a classmate, an older student, uh, actually he was a senior, uh, started witnessing very aggressively to me uh, there on our high school campus, not aggressively in the sense of being harsh, but in terms of being emphatic, telling me with practically in tears that I must be born again. And at first I thought this was some kind of crazy fad because I thought, well, if anyone's been a Christian all his life, it's me. You know, I thought I was a very good boy. <coughs> and uh, it took a few months before God finally wrestled me to the mat and showed me that I was absolutely lost in my sins, had no hope whatsoever apart from the gracious work of Jesus Christ to take my sin away, uh, that I was headed for utter destruction. And uh, ever since the night when I, I prayed the prayer that I would surrender my life to Jesus, uh, nothing has been the same. Mm. Now, obviously, in the the... Uh, book, Christianity, Cults, and Religions. You talk about the mission field around the world that is uh, for sure under attack. And and what's exactly happening with that? Well, (laughs) it's very interesting. Uh, We live in a very unusual age. I would even say it's unprecedented. Because uh, with the falling of uh, some of the national boundaries that have kept people and religions apart, Uh, the demise of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc uh, in 1989, 1991, uh, with the advent of the Internet and other forms of digital communication, it is easier for people to spread their religious views rapidly and to many others uh, than ever before. And so you see an extraordinary rise, not only in missionary Islam, but a missionary Hinduism, missionary Buddhism, not to mention groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, and uh, various other movements that want to convince you that they have the truth. And more or less simultaneously that the Bible does not really have the truth, or Jesus is not necessarily the way, or may not even be relevant to your spiritual progress. And so... Christians need to be able to make distinctions. That's what discernment is about. And this book is a discernment tool. Mm. You know, there's there's always been opposition to the gospel message. What makes, in your opinion, uh, Paul, ministry work so challenging today? Ooh, that's a broad topic. It's, 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 it's challenging for so many reasons. First of all, of course, it's uh, the sin in men's hearts. People in their natural state, don't want to know God. They don't want to give their their lives to Him. Jesus Christ wants 100% of you and me. And people are not naturally inclined to give that to somebody they don't even know or understand. It's a matter of God getting hold of that. Now, unfortunately, you have Christians who are ignorant of what the Bible says, and so they give a garbled message about Jesus, if they give one at all, Uh, They may be ignorant, they may be apathetic or complacent. You also have very defective forms of Christianity on television and elsewhere that turn people off to the true gospel. So we've got to be uh, fighting against that at the same time as we're trying to present a positive message about Jesus so folks don't just get confused. There are a lot of things that, uh, that make Christians unwilling or unable to communicate the gospel well, and people unwilling or unable to receive it well. It's, you know, we've got to be on our knees all the time praying for God to do his work in and through and around us. Mm. You know, I, I know you've touched on some of the some of the, uh, the religions out there that are very uh, off-base and are cults and things. There's um, a couple of uh, organizations that kind of come to mind that I'm going to throw out there and uh, just give us a little synopsis on those because if you're 
you know, one of those people that don't really have all the facts and you hear a group like that, you say, oh, they, you know, they, I hear they, they do a lot of good in the community, but that's just kind of a kind of a front because they're really they're really bad. And that's groups like the uh, Freemasons and the, the Demolays and things like that. Talk about uh, those if you could, Paul. Sure. We can talk about uh, Freemasonry and uh, there, there are a lot of Masonic groups. Uh, <clears throat> Here's the thing. Masonry claims to offer us secret teachings from ancient times. And some of these are ethical in a very general sense. You could say they they parallel uh, the golden rule in the Bible. It has to do with being kind to others. But uh, the Freemasonry is, uh, is a philosophy, is a movement, is a tradition that... uh, is quasi-religious. It has a lot of elements that, in most cases, would qualify it as being a religion. And the fact that it is a form of religion that denies the uniqueness and necessity of Jesus Christ makes it a very problematic association for Christians. Now, if, you know, some, if, if, you know, would I say Christians don't uh, have your child treated at the Shriners Hospital? Well, I would never say that. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that the doctors at the Shriners Hospital are not going to try and uh, try and indoctrinate your child into some form of Freemasonry as they're uh, as they're trying to uh, heal your disease. But <clears throat> Christians who are tempted to join Freemasonry, uh, whether it's uh, the Scottish Rite or the York, York Rite, uh, to take oaths binding themselves to other Freemasons who may or may not be Christians. Uh, I hope they're not, because my conviction is that Christians shouldn't be Freemasons, who are pointed in a direction not only away from biblical Christianity, but toward occultism, because, uh, because uh, advanced studies in Freemasonry almost inevitably include works by pagan and occult authors. It, it's a strange system that is uh, incompatible with biblical faith. And I personally feel that Christians should simply avoid it. It's a conflict of interest uh, and will only bring the individual confusion and probably uh, do damage, serious damage, to their witness. Mm. Uh, The reason I mention those two organizations, and then we'll get to our next question, um, as a young uh, guy... Um, 12, 10, 13, something like that. Uh, I came from a Christian home, and I was in a situation where I had a friend that asked me to go to this meeting of the Demolays. Uh-huh. Uh, and I had no idea, nor did my parents, who were Christians, what, what I was going to. But I could tell you, <laughs> uh, one visit there, and uh, I never went back again. So, you know, it's just kind of... It just kind of, the way it was presented to lure you in, you know, people that know better don't even really know what they're getting lured into. It's just kind of a disguise, and that's why I mention that, because I know that, you know, some of those organizations are kind of disguised about what they're really all about. Well, well let, me, let me make a, a very broad statement. Are you open to generalization? Absolutely. Here we go. Don't join any organization that keeps any of its beliefs secret. Amen. Period. I don't care if it's Scientology. I don't care if it's the Order of the Eastern Star. I don't care if it's Ekankar or anything else that has an outer doctrine that they're willing to explain to people on the outside and an inner doctrine that you've got to be part of through some membership ritual, oaths, uh, payment of hard green cash, uh, stuff that you can't know unless you do certain things to get on the inside. Uh, <clears throat> The Bible is a full disclosure religion. What do you want to know about Christianity? Pick up the book. It's there. Uh, People who want to make an informed decision about what to believe, what's true, what's false, what's right, what's wrong, the Bible sets the standard. It's all there. Mm. Now, obviously, there are a group of missionaries that are known as Muslim missionaries. Um, Obviously, being a Muslim missionary is probably a challenge in places like Western Europe, Africa, and elsewhere around the world. Talk to us, if you could, about maybe some of the challenges that the Muslim 
missionaries are facing today? Uh, you mean missionaries to the Muslims? Yes. Well, it's, it's very interesting because uh, <clears throat> Islam, of course, is not just an intellectual system. Uh, it, is a, it is a cultural uh, system. In fact, I'm speaking much too broadly now. Uh, is, Islam is, in a sense, a civilization. Uh, even though you have a major division uh, between Sunnis and Shiites, and then further divisions from there uh, among the major uh, uh, elements of, uh, of Islam, uh, <clears throat> you, are, you are dealing with something that, that goes beyond what we might call mere belief. Uh, people uh, are defined as individuals, as families, as nations, by their adherence to Islam. And, of course, in some cases, uh, people who uh, renounce Islam in order to embrace Jesus Christ are threatened with death by their own, very own needs. And I think anyone who follows the news will know that I'm not being sensationalistic here. Uh, this is something that's quite generally accepted and openly practiced in certain parts of the world and at times uh, brought into Western Europe, North America, uh, among immigrant populations especially. <clears throat> uh, it's also made more difficult because there is a resurgent Islamic fundamentalism. There's an extremism. There are uh, people who have emigrated to the West from majority Muslim countries, and they're, they realize that, that they're not really good Muslims, that the, the contrast between their traditional values from back home and what they encounter in the very secularized West makes them feel like they either give in and become like these secularized Westerners, or they become real true blue, uh, died in the wool Muslims who uh, become much more fervent, uh, radical than they ever were back home. And <clears throat> this kind of fervency uh, brings people to a place where they are uh, very dogmatic, very militant about what they believe. And uh, Muslim apologetics, their efforts to defend Islam against uh, skeptics and critics like Christians, have uh, become more and more sophisticated, which gives us a lot more work as well. Now, obviously, the true purpose of all this is to witness, to get people set free, to uh, get them saved, and to uh, learn about Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But in your book, you talk about the ten keys to witnessing to cults that are, uh, you know, that you mentioned in your book. What are some of those ten keys to witnessing? Well, I've got to tell you, this part of the book, by the way, the book, is, as I indicated, is a compilation. You've got material by some of the best people working in the field of cults and comparative religions. Uh, it's not a single author work. Uh, this particular section of the book was written by Ron Rhodes, who was my uh, co-host on the Bible Answer Man program for quite a few years. And he has done a terrific job explaining what is a cult, what the main things a Christian needs to know, uh, are that Christians need to know in order to contrast the central teachings of, of a cult with the essence of the Christian faith. Uh, instructions on how to relate to people who are involved in cults, especially like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, how to uh, understand their programmed responses, how to uh, clarify the terminology you're using, how to ask strategic questions, and frankly, how to approach the person who's involved in one of these groups, not just from a way that it, in, in a way that is technically correct, but also well motivated. Your, your method has got to be informed by the right motives. Are you doing this because you love the person unconditionally, or are you looking to put another spiritual notch in your belt, or put somebody in, in their place? Unfortunately, sometimes the Christians who are willing to talk to a Jehovah's Witness at the door, for example, are too eager to put them down or even humiliate them in the name of Jesus Christ instead of reaching out effectively in a way that will show the Jehovah's Witness that the Christian is motivated by a kind of love that they do not see in the Watchtower organization. And so <clears throat> Ron sets all this forth in, in 
very plain language. He even tells you how to deal with folks who may have come out of a cult group like the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses and are kind of adrift. And Christians can have a very hard time helping folks transition from uh, their disillusionment with one of these groups into a healthy faith and a walk with Christ. And again, this is just one element of this uh, section in the book that's, that's just worth its weight in gold. We're visiting with Paul Cardin, discussing the book uh, Christianity, Cults, and Religions. And Paul, you mentioned uh, during your last uh, uh, answer there that it's a compilation of uh, different uh, things, uh, all compacted in this book. Uh, how did this collection uh, come to be uh, initially? Well, I, was, uh, I contacted the publisher, Rose Publishing. Uh, wow, it was about 1994 when I saw the first version of their pamphlet, Christianity, Cults, and Religions, a uh, much smaller work than this, which, uh, out of which this book has grown, and I made some suggestions to them about how they might <laughs> refine certain parts of the pamphlet, and as the years went by, it grew and grew and grew, uh, to the point where we've added a lot of groups to uh, the main pamphlet, uh, have, have, com- have uh, compiled companion pieces like Christianity, cults, and the occult, where we deal not only with uh, groups like the Kabbalah Center and Rosicrucianism and Wicca and the Church of Satan and Spiritism and uh, Santeria and Theosophy and so forth. Uh, We went from there into creating in-depth materials about key groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons. And uh, this book, by the way, has has an excellent chapter on Islam and Christianity that that follows the general format of the book in that it is comparative. It's not just giving you lists of facts, lists of beliefs. It is contrasting what biblical Christianity teaches with what Islam typically teaches. And it gives you a glossary. It gives you recommended resources for further study. It is just a great place to not only uh, do introductory reading, but uh, it's something, you know, for quick reference, it's something that you can use for serious study. And uh, so uh, we've had a lot of great scholars come on board to be part of this, and I think that, uh, frankly, uh, everyone listening will be, would be very pleased to have this in their home. The book begins by discussing the basic beliefs of uh, biblical Christianity, are Western Christians largely uh, ignorant to the core truths, in your opinion? I think they've been exposed to it, but uh, because there's a lot of good teaching and books on uh, radio programs and so forth, but they haven't committed themselves to it in any kind of structured or disciplined way. And so it's kind of sort of a, a, a mass of... Uh, of, of beliefs and even opinions that they don't know how to summon up in a way that's useful to them so that they can explain it to other people in a way that makes sense. Uh, and so to have things spelled out as plainly as they are in here, uh, when I, and I'm talking about essential Christianity. This isn't a, you know, a Baptist book or a Pentecostal book, certainly not a Catholic book. Uh, this is something that's that's operating from the premise of uh, the things that all biblical Christians hold in common. That's the point of departure. And uh, I think that becomes very evident to the reader as they start going through the book. Can I tell folks where to get this? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, we were gonna, I was going to get to that, but go ahead, Paul. That'd be fine. Yeah, I, uh, I encourage people to go to ChristianityCultsAndReligions.com or RosePublishing.com. Uh, And in fact, we we have a free comparative chart on Jehovah's Witnesses available at rosepublishing.com that I think people would find very useful in helping them prepare for the next Watchtower missionaries who show up at their door. Mm. Uh, In addition to the book, there's, uh, I understand, a DVD series as well. Is that correct, uh, Paul? There is. There's a six-part teaching series that we put together that's being used... uh, not only here, but uh, in other parts of the world. I just got an email from Brazil where they asked me a question about uh, the first installment in the series. And (laughs) this is a great way for high school or adult 
Sunday school groups to get a handle on the essentials relating to these groups, uh, how to make distinctions among these groups, uh, how to contrast them with the Bible, how to apply scriptural truth to groups like Islam or Jehovah's Witnesses or the Moonies, so that they can build a bridge, they can understand where these folks are coming from, and connect with them for the sake of sharing the gospel. Um, one last thing I want to talk about. Um, big upsurge in occult movies and activities. Um, why do you think that it has really increased a lot over the last several years? Well, uh, there is a fascination with the occult, a fascination with the supernatural, with alternative spirituality. Uh, people are curious about things that are new, that are at least unfamiliar to them, if they're not really new, things that are uh, mysterious, things that uh, might even promise some kind of personal supernatural power. And so uh, Wicca, for example, uh, pagan, neo-paganism, things that seem to give you the hope of some kind of uh, magical ability, uh, or a religious experience that goes beyond just head knowledge. You know, could I really become one with the universe? Could I really reincarnate into a, a more powerful being? Could I really travel to other dimensions? All of this is very tempting. There's no doubt about it. And for people who have not met Jesus Christ, who are not satisfied with who God is and what he's revealed and, and what you know, he has provided to us uh, in this life and the life to come, uh, it's understandable that uh, this, uh, this would be tantalizing. And, of course, it sells. Uh, it's, uh, it's juicy stuff, and it's ripe for dramatization in, uh, in uh, major studio films. Mm. Paul, obviously the reason we put this program on is to get people educated, informed, and get them set free. If someone's listening to this program, they say, you know, I've been involved in this, or I've been drawn to this, and I want to get set free, would you take a moment, Paul, and just say a prayer for those people? Absolutely. But let's do that. Gracious Lord, thank you that you have revealed yourself in creation, that you have given us a beautiful world in which to live a world filled with marvels and wonders and beauty. Thank you as well, Lord, that you have revealed yourself through your word, through Jesus Christ, the living word, and through the pages of Scripture, that you've told us we're separated from you by our sins, that there's no hope of making ourself, ourselves right with you through our efforts, that we cannot be good enough, we cannot try hard enough, that all our efforts in that, in that way are just misplaced because... There's only one solution, and it's what Jesus Christ has done for us, just what we celebrated not long ago at Easter time, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again bodily on the third day, that he satisfied your requirements, Lord, that he, that he suffered your wrath in our place, and that by trusting in his completed and sufficient work, by believing that Every wrong thing we've done and the consequences we deserve spiritually for those things has been taken away by Jesus Christ. We can enter into eternal life. We can have newness of life, not only after we die, but right now, that we can enter into a loving relationship with you that will never end. Please, God, open the hearts, open the minds of those folks who are listening who haven't yet trusted in Jesus Christ. Help them to understand and to accept his incredible offer of love and salvation. Move in them, we pray. And may they join us in rejoicing at the throne of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul, one last time, would you tell us if we'd like to obtain a copy of the book or learn more about uh, this uh, collection, Christianity, Cults, and Religions, and the DVD series? Can you give us that website contact information one more time to obtain a copy? Sure. Sure. Either go to rosepublishing.com or to Christianity, Cults, and Religions.com. And I think people will get a 
just a world of help there. Amen. Our guest tonight on Second Chances has been Paul Carden. And, Paul, we'd like to thank you for being a guest right here on Second Chances. Appreciate the invitation. May God bless you. Same to you.